Happy uh, Memorial Day to you all, too. I mean, I remember as a kid, I, I thought Memorial Day was just uh, the day that you got the pool ready for the summer, but it, it has much more of a depth and a meaning to that, and we're going to invite uh, Fred, uh, friendly Fred Brinkman up in a little bit to, to uh, pray for that and to uh, give us a little more information about that. But uh, thank you all for coming here. A little bit lighter just with the holiday weekend, but we are blessed uh, that you guys are here. Uh, Pastor Ken is kind of ending his vacation, and he'll be back with us uh, next week. And so we'll have the privilege of having uh, Chris uh, Steyer back up here to finish uh, his uh, message on Idols of the Heart. He's going to probably ask you if you did your homework, just, just so you know. And last week we got some good tips on women's shoes shopping. Maybe we'll get some uh, uh, helpful uh, hints on makeup tonight. We don't know, but... Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it means you got to go back and listen to uh, last week's message. So we'll do that. But hey, with that, we want to welcome everybody that's uh, either in the uh, old sanctuary watching us there or live streaming at home. Thank you so much for doing that. And then we also want to uh, welcome any of the visitors that we have here. So we have some gentlemen that are going to make their way to the front, and they've got some helpful information about our church with them. One of the things is our welcome booklet. So as they make their way from the front to the back, you just kind of raise your hand. Uh, they can uh, give you this booklet. Uh, they can give you uh, sermon notes, sermon outlines for today. Uh, they also have some other information or a pen if you need it. But there's a Lakeside Connection card in there. And if you would just be so kind as to fill that card out for us so we'd have some information about you, you can drop it off at the Welcome Center after the service today give us an opportunity to meet with you and say hello, and it would just be a great way for us to connect with you. So again, thank you so much uh, for coming out. And 
as the school year uh, slows down or stops, uh, the summer activities really start to uh, pick up as well. So coming up here, uh, starting here in just a few weeks, will be our super summer study, uh, which will start on June the 15th, June the 15th, and it'll be a six-week study on uh, being battle ready, battle ready, a great study in uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 6, and I'm looking forward to it. We're going through uh, 1 John with the, the next levelers, the middle schoolers, and so I think it's going to go very well with what we're doing there. Also, hard to believe that next week, a week from Monday, will be kids camp. Kids camp. We're very excited about that, and uh, there's going to be uh, a meeting for uh, kids camp uh, next Sunday. So uh, kids camp, uh, starting on June the 6th, will run from 8.30 to 12 noon, Monday through Friday, starting June the 6th. And there's going to be a, a team leaders meeting next Sunday before camp uh, gets started after church, June the 5th, following the service. Uh, if you're assistant team leader, you're also welcome to attend as well. And also, as you know, if you've been here for any length of time, that's also the, the time that we transform uh, our church into whatever we transform it into, a spaceship or whatever. But it, it is really impressive to see uh, what they do for kids camp. So lunch will be provided, so rather you're a leader, assistant leader, or somebody that just is good with a, a hammer and walking up and down a ladder, love to have you come and help us next Sunday for that right after church. And next Sunday is Promotion Sunday, so uh, all your students, all our students, all your children will be moving up a grade, so if they uh, have uh, completed uh, fifth grade, they'll be moving up into to next level. Uh, completed eighth grade, moving into 220, and so on down the line. So next Sunday is our uh, promotion Sunday. Uh, also, uh, this weekend tomorrow is going to be contact sports soccer tournament. So that's going to be tomorrow. And we're going to be utilizing our new fields right out there. Uh, and it's going to start at 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock tomorrow evening, the soccer tournament will begin if you all of a sudden have been uh, you know, in a cave and you're like, man, I, I've got a team, I want to play, uh, contact Kyle. They still haven't done the bracket yet, so just make sure you get with him today so that they can do that as well. Uh, also, uh, today is really the last Sunday uh, for the Baby Bottle Fundraiser Lifeline Pregnancy Center. Uh, so if you've got one of those baby bottles, get it turned in as soon as possible so that we can, uh, you know, get that collected and be able to provide that uh, for that pregnancy center for the great work uh, that they're doing there. Uh, then finally, our new summer adult equipping hour will begin here next Sunday as well, June the 5th, uh, called The Church, The Pillar and Ground of Truth. So that will be starting uh, next week. And so what we're going to do is we're going to play a little short video uh, about that to kind of whet your appetite for the new equipping series. And then also then after that, Fred will come up and uh, pray for us. Imagine there was a great king who loved his bride more than anything. And he's going to go on a long journey. And before he goes on that journey, he calls us, he calls, he calls you, he calls one man and he says, you will be the steward and you will take care of my bride. Now she's most precious to me. Here are the decrees by which you will care for her. This is what you shall do and shall not do with her. You must fulfill everything. Your faithfulness will be rewarded. Your unfaithfulness, your unconcern for these decrees regarding my bride will be punished. And so the king goes on a long journey and he's gone for a long time. And the steward begins to notice that the people are losing interest in the king and they're losing interest in his bride, the queen, because she's somewhat pale and, and, and plain and, and old fashioned for them. So he decides that in order to save the kingdom, he is going to remake the bride. And, and in doing that, he's going to change her simple but elegant uh, white robe into something uh, a, a bit more eye catching and flashy. He's going to paint her face and change her hair and then parade her in front of carnal men in order to attract them somehow back into the kingdom. 
When that king returns, what is he going to do to that steward? I'm sure he'll take his life. He'll judge him most severely. He'll look at him and say, who do you think that you are? That you would do this to my bride, especially in light of the specific commands that I gave you. And we can see the same thing today. We see so many men that are trying to transform, redress, repackage the bride of Christ so that worldly men might somehow be attracted to the king. I think those men should be extremely afraid. When Uzzah reaches out to touch the ark, I mean, his heart, so to speak, is in the right place. He loves the ark. He doesn't want the ark to touch the ground. And he reaches out and he touches it in a forbidden manner. And God essentially says to us, through killing Uzzah, this is not about what you want or what you feel. This is about what I say. And that matters. Honor the Memorial Day, I think it would be wise to first understand exactly who and what we are remembering. There are numerous days throughout the year that we remember our military. There are, however, only three days that we truly adhere to. First is Armed Forces Day, which is observed on the third Saturday every May. This is a day dedicated to pay tribute to men and women currently serving in the U.S. Armed Forces. Second is Veterans Day recognized November 11th every year. This is the anniversary of the signing of the Armistice Treaty, which ended World War I, and is also a day to thank military veterans for their service. Actually, there's no bad time to thank those men and women, but November 11th is the day set aside. Third is Memorial Day. This is the day set aside on May 30th each year to remember the brave men and women who died while serving in the military. Since 1775, in American wars that we have fought, there has been over 1.3 million lives lost, lost in battle. Men and women who were patriots, willing to give their all so that you and I could enjoy the many freedoms that we have today, such as the freedom to attend this very worship time, to sing praises to our Lord, and to hear God's word preached, to be able to gather and openly pray to our loving Father. I consider it an honor and a privilege to be asked to pray for those many who have given their all for us. But before we pray, I would like to ask, do we have any surviving members in attendance today who have lost a loved one in battle? If there is, would you please stand? Okay. We do thank them the families, the surviving family members for their sacrifice to our country. And we ask that God would be with them during their loss as well. <clears throat> as our dear brother Tom Walters often asked, let us join our hearts together now and let's go to our Lord at this time. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, on this Memorial Day weekend, it is with gratitude and honor that we remember and give thanks for those who have given their lives in the service of our country. When the need was great, they stepped forward and did their duty to defend the freedoms that we enjoy and to win the same for others. O oh Lord, you yourself have taught us that no love is greater than that which gives itself for another. These honored dead gave the most precious gift they had life itself, for loved ones and neighbors, for comrades and country, and for us. Help us, Lord, to honor their memory by caring for their family members they have left behind, by ensuring that their wounded comrades are properly cared for, 
by being watchful caretakers of the freedoms for which they gave their lives, and by praying that no other young men and women would follow them to the soldier's grave unless the reason is worthy and the cause is just. Father, help us to remember that freedom is not free. There are times when its cost is indeed dear. Never let us forget those who paid so terrible a price to ensure that freedom would be our legacy. And Lord, though their names may fade with the passing of time of generations, may we never forget what they have done. And help us, Lord, to be worthy of their sacrifice. Lord, on this and future Memorial Days, help us to remember and honor all who have served and sacrificed for our freedom. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the many freedoms that we have this day. And we thank you most of all for the love, grace, and mercy that you continually bestow upon us. And Father, it's in the name above all names that we pray and ask these things. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would turn to Psalm 118. As we read the Word of God this morning. Psalm 118. We'll... Go through the first nine verses. Title in the uh, NASB is Thanks, Thanksgiving for the Lord's Saving Goodness. Would you stand with me? Give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let Israel say, His loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let the house of Aaron say, his loving kindness is everlasting. O oh, let those who fear the Lord say, His loving kindness is everlasting. For my distress I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Let's pray over the word of God together. Father, as we pray over this psalm, we're reminded of your saving goodness, who you are, what you have done, that you've called our name in eternity past to save us uh, through a future eternity, to be reminded of our God of salvation, to be charged with the reality of what can man do to me. Father, it is our heart's desire to please the Lord in gratitude and joyful obedience. And we ask that as we do that, that we would wholly trust in you all the days of our lives. We thank you for the privilege of being here this morning. And we pray that our hearts would be attentive as we worship and listen to our scripture being preached. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Looking forward to singing now together as we take our minds and set them upon the Lord and his ways. Let's do it together, singing nothing in all the earth.
referencing a not me, not in me song we taught about a, maybe a month and a half ago. And it's so good because it really exemplifies and it really puts in front of us Christ and what he's done, not us. There's nothing, there's no, not even the ability to intellectually handle and retain doctrine and theology in your mind is enough to justify you before God, but only Christ alone. So let's sing the song and, and rejoice in what Christ has done. No list of sins I have not done, no list of virtues I pursue, no list of those I am not like. Well, I can say I love coming to church every Sunday. I love to be with God's people worshiping the Lord. I love to hear the reading of God's word, the teaching of God's word. I love to be with you, and I hope that's true of you as well, that you love coming to church. We could just sing the gospel, an alien righteousness that was not my own, secured in the person and work of Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. Amen. Well, it's truly a a joy to be here with you again this morning for part two of last week's message. And we began to study idols of the heart. Pastor Brad Bigney gave us that really simple, great definition. I have it on the back of your handout. An idol is anything or anyone that begins to capture our hearts and minds and affections more than God. 
And quite simply, it happens when we find a substitute for God, when we find something or someone else who takes the place of God in our life. So we began to study Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 3 to 8 last week, to better understand how idols get into our hearts and what their dangerous consequences are when we allow them to remain. So let's go back and read Ezekiel 14, 1 to 3, just to see where we left off last week. We're going to jump right into the text this morning. Ezekiel chapter 14, starting in verse 1. Then some elders of Israel came to me and sat down before me, and the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and have put right before their faces the stumbling block of their iniquity. Should I be consulted by them at all? Here we find this delegation of elders of Israel arriving at the house of the prophet Ezekiel, and they are seeking counsel from God. God, knowing their hearts, speaks to the prophet here in verse 3, acknowledging that these elders of Israel set up heart idols. Who is to blame for these heart idols? They are. We saw that last week. And not only that, but these heart idols that they have set up right before their face, the stumbling block of their iniquity, are the ones that have tripped them up and will trip them up and they will fall. So again, remember the historical context that we looked at last week. These elders were carried away by King Nebuchadnezzar from Jerusalem to Babylon. More than anything, here in exile, what do they want? Remember my illustration of those rowdy liberal Californians. If they came and took us to live in the downtown Los Angeles, what would you want, Texas? To come home. It's no different for these elders of Israel. They want to go home. They want to go back to Jerusalem, which has not yet been destroyed. Why do they want to go back? So they can go back to their religion, their hypocrisy, their idolatrous worship of Yahweh their way. All the while committing these idolatrous abominations in private, we looked at chapter 8. Ezekiel was taken in the spirit from Babylon back to Jerusalem to see what was going on in the temple, and even there, the elders of Jerusalem were worshiping idolatrously. So rather than trusting God and submitting to His will, and worshiping Him, even through the difficulty of their exile, they instead choose hypocrisy. And their idols tripped them up, drove them to make decisions that in hindsight were incredibly foolish, as we'll see a little bit later in chapter 20. Brad Bigney uses a very creative illustration. I think it will appeal to us as Texans. Do we have any hunters in the room? Don't be, don't be bashful. Some of you are like, come on, if you're a hunter, yeah. Some of you are unsure. What happens to the buck when they smell a doe that's in heat? It's interesting, isn't it? It doesn't matter what stands in their way. It could be a river. It could be a highway, a barbed wire fence, a four-lane highway. It could be the front end of my Toyota Camry. That happened. Nothing and no one is going to stop them because when they smell that dough, they take off running. They throw caution to the wind. Think about this. Here's an animal that spends 345 days a year doing what? Avoiding humans, avoiding danger. But during that short season around mid-November, they plunge down wide open hills. They dart across four-lane highways. They do whatever it takes to find and obtain that doe. This is a scary picture of us chasing down our own heart idols, isn't it? As we perfect and protect our heart idols, as we justify and rationalize them, we begin to progressively throw caution to the wind We ignore God's word. We ignore the warnings of Scripture. We tune out friends, family that plead with us to listen to reason and biblical counsel. We don't see the barbed wire, the traffic, the open manholes, the street, because we're focused on one thing and one thing only, chasing down, feeding, serving, and obtaining that idol. But unlike the buck, who only seems to go out of his mind, 
crazy two to four weeks a year, we chase our idols all year round. And sadly, some of us do it for a lifetime. Well, just like these men of Israel, these elders of Israel, we have set up heart idols and put before our faces the stumbling block of our iniquity. And when we do that, we fall and we're tripped up. And so that brings us up to to speed up to our third principle, describing the dangerous consequences of allowing them to remain. Notice verse 4. Therefore, speak to them and tell them, thus says the Lord God, any man of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart puts right before his face the stumbling block of his iniquity and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will be brought to give him an answer in the matter in view of the multitude of his idols. It's interesting. God will not give them the answer that they crave. Again, what is the answer they crave? Just to remind you from last week. What do they want more than anything? Freedom. Freedom right around the corner. Go back to Jerusalem so they can re-engage and worship God their way idolatrously. No. Instead, they received this direct answer from God through the prophet Ezekiel. This is not the answer they wanted, but it is the answer they desperately need to hear. And notice, God is fully aware of the multitude of their idols at the end of verse 4 there. This word carries the idea of a great number. In fact, it can be translated with the sense of an abundance. There's an abundance of idols. It's not a handful. It's not a couple. It's a few. It's not a few. It's a lot. I mean, think of a pack or a herd. We have a pack of idols. In fact, it's very rare for idols of the heart to be alone or to be isolated because they tend to compound and multiply. Even last week, we've already seen how a desire in the heart, even a good desire, a biblical desire, can become idolatrous if it begins to capture our heart, our mind, our affections more than God. Remember, a good thing becomes a what? A God thing. And if you allow a good thing to become a God thing where it's more important than God, what does it become? How many of you were paying attention last week? A bad thing. Say it with me. A good thing. You weren't ready. Say it with me. A good thing becomes a God thing, which becomes a bad thing. You got it? And that's true in your life and it's true in mine. Like dominoes, these heart idols produce more idols. In fact, let me just give you one simple illustration, money. 1 Timothy 6 has a lot to say about money. What's the problem with money? Is money in and of itself evil or wrong? What does Paul tell Timothy? It's not money that's the problem, it's the what of money, the love of money. It's the love of money. Maybe it starts out with a good desire to have enough money, to pay rent, to buy food, to provide for your family. Is there anything wrong in that? No, there's no idol. But if a person gets a taste of what money provides, they may begin to fix their hope on it. Again, that's the warning in 1 Timothy 6. Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, instruct those who are rich not to be conceited and not to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. Now, the heart idol of the love of money is established. And what does it do? It doesn't remain alone. It begins to churn out to produce more heart idols. And so now someone who loves money, what do they typically become? They become a workaholic. Why? Why? Because the way to get it is to work hard. They become a workaholic. Their priorities been, begin to shift. Instead of God being first and my wife being second and my kids and so on and so forth, what becomes number one? All of a sudden, work and money and achieving financial goals. Wife, kids, church, second. Maybe they develop the mentality of a hoarder rather than a giver, they become Scrooge. God gives this, all of this for me, not for others. And what happens when you try to get in his way of achieving the thing that he loves? He'll attack you. 
He'll remove you. You are an, a stumbling block between him and what he loves, that is money. What about the herd of idols in the hearts of these elders of Israel? Again, think about it. They want to go back to Jerusalem so they can worship God their way. In order to do that, they have to be free of Babylonian rule. They want to go back to the positions of power and ease that they once had. They want to hear from God as long as it fits their agenda and so on. And notice the Lord knows the multitude of their heart idols, and He will give him an answer. And what is this answer? That any person in Israel who is an idolater and sets a stumbling block in his own path will receive an answer from God, not in words, but in divine judgment. And we're going to see that in our final point in verses 6 to 8. Therefore, begins verse 4, You see, God is now going to respond to the request for a word from the Lord. In fact, this helps us to understand God's rhetorical question at the end of verse 3. What does he say? He's talking to Ezekiel. He's saying, should I be consulted by them at all? What's the answer, church? No. Absolutely not. Because God knows their heart idols. He knows the reason why they're coming seeking counsel from God through the prophet Ezekiel. Think about this. God is not going to help them protect and perfect their idols. Did you get that? He's not going to help them perfect and protect their idols. Isaiah 42.8, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. He's not going to say, well, at least you're giving me 70%. That's okay, elders of Israel. You're, you're giving it your best shot. I mean, you got a little bit of idolatry, but that's okay. God's not going to help them secure and shelter their idols. In fact, you know what God's going to do? He's going to help them see why They are in this idolatrous condition in the first place. In fact, he is going to frustrate their pursuit of idols. Again, these elders had already listened to the false prophets of chapter 13. This isn't the first time that a crisis has caused the people of God to seek out a divine word from the Lord. They would go to anyone who seemed to have God's ear, including the prophets, and even as we see in the Old Testament, even mediums and spiritists. In fact, let me just give you one quick Old Testament example. I think most of us remember 1 Samuel 28, verse 7. Saul, faced with the army of the Philistines, he goes and says, hey, find me a medium. Now, what's a medium? It's a witch. It's a spiritist. Someone who spoke to the dead people. And so they go, hey, there's a, there's a medium in Endor. And so he goes to find this medium in Endor in Philistine territory under the cover of night. He even dresses up as a woman. He probably was not wearing women's shoes. Why does he do it? All to hear from the dead prophet Samuel with the hopes that he and his army would be victorious over the Philistines. He has an agenda. And he goes, and this medium does what he asks, and Samuel comes from the grave and says, why are you disturbing my rest? Samuel warns Saul that God has taken his kingdom from him because of his disobedience, and that tomorrow he and his sons will be killed. And in 1 Samuel 31, what do we find in the narrative? He and his sons, what? Does it surprise you to find that they are killed? Here's the million dollar question. What's the common denominator in both of our Old Testament texts between these elders of Israel here in Ezekiel 14 and Saul? They all approach God. They're looking for divine wisdom and help. The question is why? What are they after? Answer? They are looking for divine approval to keep one foot in God's kingdom and one foot in their own. That's ultimately what's going on here. They have an agenda. 
They will follow, they will obey God and his word when it suits them, when it fulfills their purposes, when it aligns with their desires and their goals. But when their desires and God's desires come into conflict, the multitude of their unrepentant heart idols will always result in disobedience to God. And what does that produce? Incredibly dangerous consequences. The reality is we're no better. I mean, what do you do when God uses a sermon that you hear to convict you that the relationship that you're currently in is not honoring to the Lord? Have you ever had that happen? Some of you are married, but you remember when you were single. You were in a relationship and you heard a sermon. It felt like the preacher was talking directly to you through the word of God. The spirit was convicting you in your heart. And what did you do in that moment? How do you respond when the Spirit of God convicts you that you're wasting too much time in your hobbies? Your hobbies, it's not the hobbies in and of themselves that are bad or wrong. It's that they're out of balance. And you're not serving others like you should. You're not considering others as more important than yourself. You're thinking about you and what you want to do and what makes you happy and what satisfies you. What happens when a friend or a spouse threatens something that you love by using a Bible verse to point out a repeating sin pattern in your life. And you know it's pulling you away from the Lord. What do you think it means when you get angry when they do that? What are they threatening? The idol that you have set up in your heart and the word of God is coming and threatening to take it away. How do you respond when the multitude of your idols are exposed by God, by the word of God, by the people of God? Sometimes God used circumstances. Sometimes God used trials. How do you respond when God brings these circumstances that rock your boat and challenge your idolatrous, half-hearted worship? Do you attack? You know, some people, you're not a fighter. You're, you're not the fight, you're the flight. <laughs> and you run the other way and you isolate yourself. Or maybe you avoid deep relationships. Do we have people here at Lakeside Bible Church that just come, they sit, they listen, but they don't really connect deeply with other Christians? Because if they do, what's at risk? God forbid that someone would find out what I really love, so I will keep everyone at arm's length. Is that you this morning? You're part of the church, but you're not really part of the church. Don't be like these elders. In fact, don't be like the hypocritical Pharisees of Jesus' day. Look at Matthew 15, verse 8. Turn there with me. This wasn't just an Old Testament problem. This was a New Testament problem, and it's a problem for us today. Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. Jesus is interacting with these Pharisees and the scribes. They're always trying to trick him up, trap him. And what does he say about these religious leaders in verse 8? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of man. Is that not the epitome of hypocrisy? To come to church and sit under the, the reading of God's word and to sing songs extolling the person and work of Christ and our response to him to listen to the preaching of God's word and then to walk out those doors and do nothing about it. What's ruling in the heart? Well, if multitudes of idols are there, that's the result. Back in Ezekiel 14, notice our next result in verse 5. Our heart idols often will estrange us from God. Not only do our heart idols produce more heart idols in verse 4, but our heart idols estrange us from God in verse 5. Notice, in order to lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel, who are estranged from me through all their idols. It's interesting, in order to lay hold of the hearts, this verb is often translated to seize, to seize has the idea of capturing cities or captives with forceful apprehension. 
As one commentator observes, this is good news because it means God is coming for them. Hooray! But it's also bad news. Why? God is coming for them. You get it? He's not going to allow them to remain where they're at. He is going to literally arrest, seize the dispositions of their hearts. Because when you capture a person's heart on the inside, the rest of the outside will follow. Is that true? Do the things that you desire, the things you crave, do they often control you? And this expression reminds us that the focus of the problem is the heart, the desires of the heart, not just the external manifestations. I mentioned that last week. We're not just about behavior modification, changing patterns on the outside. If I don't deal with the idolatrous desires of my heart and all I do is change the outside, they're just going to come out in some other way. I use this illustration all the time. How many of you like to go play that whack-a-mole game? Huh? Any adults? You're like, I'm not admitting that. Okay, a couple, a few. When you start that game and one little mole comes up and you whack it, what happens next? Game over? No. Okay, whack it, and then what happens? It pops up over here. So what do you do with that mallet? You whack it. And then what happens? It pops up in two places. And so now you're like, whack, whack. Pretty soon what happens, kids? What happens to those moles? They pop up all over the place, and you are whacking that thing. You're like, oh, my hand, I need a break. I'm whacking these moles. You change the behavior of here. Okay, I'm not going to speak with that tone of voice. I'm going to stop doing that. But the heart idol does what? It comes up over here. Okay, I'm not going to yell at that person because that's wrong. I know I shouldn't. Okay, and then what happened? Okay, I'm going to change my behavior. Oh, and then it pops up over here, and pretty soon it's popping up everywhere. Because what have you ignored? The desires, the idols that are going on in the inside that are now manifesting themselves. Turn with me to Psalm 66, 18. Psalm 66, 18. Just go to the left a couple books. Psalm 66, 18. The psalmist says, if I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. God's not willing to hear or answer these idolatrous elders. Why? Because they have wickedness in their hearts. They must repent. So here in Ezekiel 14, God communicates a terrifying reality at the end of verse 5. Our heart idols estrange us from God. This word estrange literally means to turn away or to alienate oneself. In fact, how do we often use this word today? Do you ever use, hey, I'm estranged from someone positively? Unless it's, you know, old Uncle Ed that nobody likes. (laughs) Oh, no, you keep him out, out of the house. We don't let that guy in anymore. When you say I'm estranged from someone, is that ever positive? It's negative. Why? In fact, Webster's Dictionary says it's to alienate, to break a bond of affection or loyalty. It implies the development of indifference or hostility with consequent separation or divorce. Think about this. Heart idols estrange us from God where once there was love and friendship and loyalty and communion. Now there is distance There's indifference, and in some cases, even hostility. We were a friend with God, and now what do our heart idols do? Make us enemies. We look at God as the enemy. We're estranged. And here it has the idea of defecting from the covenant of God by violating the first command. Again, I mentioned this last week. What's the first command in Exodus 23? Chapter 20, verse 3. You shall have no other what before me? No other gods. The point is idols put distance between us and God. They make us a stranger. In fact, jump ahead to verse 7. Anyone of the house of Israel, the immigrants who stay in Israel, who separates himself from me. What did it say? What do idols do? Separate us from God. 
They separate us. We choose idols over God. So let me ask you this morning. Has there ever been a time in your Christian life when God felt distant? Maybe you didn't feel close to God. We use that expression, I'm praying to God and my prayers just keep hitting the what? Ceiling. Or maybe you read the word of God and it was clear what the word of God was telling you to do and you said, I don't feel like doing this right now. Is it possible that the cause of this was idolatry taking place in your heart? Because you can either choose to be close with God or you can choose to be close with your idols, but not both. It's either or. Idols will make us feel like a stranger to God because we walk to them, we walk away from who? The Lord. So I asked you this morning, is God beginning to help you identify the stumbling blocks in your life, the idolatry behind, if, if you're coming this morning and saying, that's me, I, God feels distant. Maybe God's helping you see the idolatry. So I asked you, did you pray Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24 this last week? God, search me, test me, see if there be any anxious thought or evil way in me, and what? Lead me, What? in the everlasting way. Are you humbly praying that? And I would encourage you, as Tim said, I am going to hold you accountable. Keep praying that prayer. When should you stop praying that prayer? When have you and I ever fully rooted out the idols of our hearts? When we get to heaven, come, Lord Jesus, come, amen? Man, I am such an idolater. But sometimes that distance is the reality that you really don't want God all that much. In fact, turn back to the psalm, Psalm 73. Psalm 73, verse 25. Can you honestly pray this this morning? Psalm 73, starting in verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Are you trusting in God alone this morning when things go wrong or you have trouble or difficulty, is God the one that you run to as a refuge? Remember, what does Psalm 46 verse 1 say? God is our refuge, a very present help in times of trouble. Do you run to him or are you running to someone or something else? Because the more you run to someone or something else, what does it do to your fellowship, the intimacy of your relationship with God? It makes you a stranger and an alien. Lastly, notice the final result. Verses 6 through 8. Verses 6 through 8, back in Ezekiel 14, unrepentant heart idols have dangerous consequences. Not only do they multiply, not only do they estrange us from God, but they have dangerous consequences, particularly if we, are, if we leave them, if we allow them to remain in our hearts. Verse 6, therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God. What does God have to say? This is the message. This is the answer. Repent and turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all your abominations. For anyone of the house of Israel or of the immigrants who stay in Israel, who separates himself from me, sets up his idols in his heart, puts right before his face the stumbling block of his iniquity, and then comes to the prophet to inquire of me for himself, I, the Lord, will be brought to answer him in my own person. Does that sound good? Verse 8, 
I will set my face against that man and make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from among my people, so you will know that I am the Lord. Unrepentant heart idols have dangerous consequences. In verse 6, God calls them to repent of their idols and the abominations. In verse 7, he repeats the warning of verse 4, but notice he widens it to include even the immigrants who reside in Israel, not just the men and women of Israel, but even if you're an alien, if you're a stranger, if you're not Jewish, but you're living with the people of Israel, this applies even to you. And it's illogical. In fact, it's inappropriate what they're doing. This is so hypocritical. Notice verse 7. They separate themselves from God. Then what do they do? They set up heart idols. Then what do they do? They place sinful stumbling blocks before their faces. And notice the text says, and then they seek out God? Does that sound right to you? They defect from God, and then they seek Him out. If they don't repent and forsake their idols, again, that's what it means to turn away from your idols. You admit them, you confess them, you agree with God. God, that is wrong, it is sinful, it is evil, it is wicked, it is what you hate. I did it, I admit it, I confess it, I forsake it, I turn from it and turn to you. And if they don't repent, if they don't turn, then God warns them of three dangerous consequences in verse 8. Notice the first. He will set his face against them. I will set my face against that man. Notice the play on words here in verses 3, 6, and 7. They're setting their faces upon what? They're turning their faces from God to idols. If they don't repent, if they don't turn, if they don't set their face towards God, he will in turn do what? I will set my face against that man. Typically in the Old Testament, God setting his face toward you has the idea of God blessing you or looking upon you with favor. In fact, uh, just one example in Psalm 67, 1 God be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. It's what happens when the the groom is standing at the front with the pastor and the minute he sees his bride come in, you're all looking at her. Have you ever stopped and looked at his face? Because the minute he sees her, what happens to his face? It lights up. Because as he sees her, what is his heart filled with? Love. Love. In adoration, I can't wait for you to be my wife. Can you walk a little faster, honey? Pick up the pace in those heels. Love and adoration. And his face is shining upon her. You know what's going on here in Ezekiel? The opposite of that. It's the exact opposite. If you turn your face away from God, he will do the same. But instead of receiving God's full blessing, you receive his full wrath. Enmity, not exaltation. Not merely turning his face away, but turning his face against you. You see the difference? In fact, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 3, verse 5, verse 6, talks about how God says, if you break my covenant, I will cut you off. Deuteronomy 28, 27 says, I will smite you. We have this language. What does it mean when God sets his face against you, a person or a nation or a people? It's not good. He will set his face against them. But then secondly, notice in verse 8, they will become an example I will set my face against that man and make him a sign and a proverb. Their failure to obey and the resulting consequences of their sin will be used by God as a sign to warn others of what happens when people reject God. 
And that's the purpose of these consequences found at the end of verse 8. So that you will know what? That I am the Lord. What does that mean for a believer? Well, it means discipline. Again, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 to 6. Those whom the Lord loves, he what? Disciplines, chastises, if you're a King James or... Discipline. God loves you. He's going to discipline you. As an unbeliever, what does it mean? It means wrath. John 3, 36. He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Think about this with me. In certain cultures, if you see someone missing a right hand... What does that mean? They took something that didn't belong to them, and what did the government do? Not again. So every time you see that man walk through the markets, what do you, what, what do you remember? That loaf of bread looks really good, but I think I'd rather keep my hand. In pirate movies... Yo-ho, yo-ho, the pirate's life for me. What do they have hanging in front of the town and in front of the harbor as the ships come in? Come on, kids, help me out. What do they have? A cage. And what's inside that cage? Not a canary. Tweet, tweet. What's in there? A skeleton. And what is the skeleton wearing? Pirate hat. You come in to our town, you come into our harbor, you think piracy is the way to go? We're going to put you in with Skeletor here. That's your fate. What does that become? A sign, a proverb, a living illustration of what happens when you go against God. That's what he means here. Do you really want your life to become the visible example used to communicate what happens to those who cling to idols? That's the warning. You become a walking billboard of what not to do. But then there's a third consequence. Notice what he says in verse 8. And I will cut him off from among my people. They will be cut off. Now again, in Old Testament times, it either meant to be cut off from the covenant, excluded from God's people, and therefore denied access to Yahweh, or it meant to be destroyed, to be killed. Uh, Just look at verse 9. If the prophet is prevailed upon to speak a word, it is I, the Lord, who have prevailed upon that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people Israel. To destroy in this sense is to kill not just remove or cut off. And so again, you can look at Leviticus chapter 20, verses 2 to 6. In that section, you have examples of both excommunication and extermination. Excommunication, what does that mean? You're put out of the church. You're put out of the people of God. Extermination, death. You're either cast out or you're killed. Again, we see this in the New Testament as well. Matthew 18, church discipline. If you have a professing Christian who refuses to turn from their sin and return to the Lord, after multiple steps of begging them to repent and return and be restored to the Lord and His church, what is the church required to do? Separate yourself. Put them out of the church and treat them how? like a Gentile or a tax tax collector. So even in the New Testament, we're told to do this with a professing Christian who refuses to repent of clear and obvious sin. But then you look at 1 Corinthians 11.30, and we see a different type of New Testament example. What happens when people partake of the Lord's table in a way that does not give God glory, does not honor Him? When you treat the Lord with indifference and don't properly judge the holiness of communion rightly, 
It says, many among you are weak and sick, and a number, what? Some of you are like, well, I'm, I was taking a nap just a moment ago until you woke me up. Is that what he's talking about? Sleeping? What does it mean? They're dead. And a number sleep. Remember, what were the dangerous consequences that Saul suffered? God turned from him, gave the nation with another, and death for he and his sons. And what about these elders of Israel? Well, just look at Ezekiel 20. Ezekiel 20. I've quoted it a couple times. Ezekiel 20, verse 1. Now in the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth of the month, certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. They do it again. Throughout this chapter, Ezekiel reminds them of the lessons from the lives of their forefathers in Egypt and the wilderness. It's very interesting. Verse 5, the day, say to them, thus says the Lord God on the day when I chose Israel and swore to the descendants of the house of Jacob, made myself known to them in the land of Egypt when I swore to them, saying, I am the Lord your God. On that day I swore to them to bring them out from the land of Egypt into a land that I had selected for them, the land of milk and honey. Verse 7, I said, cast away each of you the detestable things of his eyes. Do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. In verse 8, what did the forefathers do of these elders of Israel? Verse 8, but they rebelled against me. They were not willing to listen to me. They did not cast away the detestable things of their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I resolved to pour out my wrath on them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of of the land of Egypt, but I acted for the sake of my name that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations among whom they lived. He's warning them. He's reminding them what? Don't forget your history. Don't forget from where you came. Just like your forefathers, so to you. And then in verse 33, As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And then he goes on, if you read all that through the rest of the chapter, God's going to judge them. He's going to discipline them so that they will repent and turn to him. God will use whatever circumstances necessary to purge the idols from their hearts and their lives. And it's possible that some of us even here this morning are experiencing some of these dangerous consequences of allowing idols to remain in your own heart. Perhaps God is using these consequences as a means of disciplining you to recapture or seize your heart. He's frustrating your plans. The idols that you've set up as they multiply and you're pursuing something and that thing or that person is becoming more important to you than Jesus Christ. What was God's solution? How are we to deal with idolatry? Verse 6, thus says the Lord God, repent and turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all your abominations. Again, he doesn't tell them what they hope to hear, what they crave, but he does tell them what they need to hear. There is hope when you're feeling hopeless, grief-stricken, abandoned, when you are suffering because of the consequences of your sin or someone else's sin, when everything seems to be spinning out of control, And when you can't change the past, you seem to have no control over the present, and you have no idea what the future holds for you. God provides a way out through the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's incredibly hope-filled. God is calling you this morning to put your trust in Him alone, evidenced by your forsaking of your idols and returning to Him turning to his ways. That's the hope of the gospel, isn't it? All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of God's glory. And what are the result? The wages of our sin is death. 
but for the man, woman, and child who turns from their sin and turns to Christ as Lord and Savior. What is the hope and the promise that we have? Jesus takes our sin to the cross, and what do we get in return? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that is what the Lord is offering you this morning if you have never turned from sin and self to Christ. Now, there's some of you, you are Christians. You do love the Lord. You are striving to honor Him, and you may be caught up in some idolatrous ways as well. Guess what? The solution is still the same. It's not salvific in the sense of salvation and repentance, but what is it? In the process of sanctification. And God may be using these things to show you how you have become estranged from Him, distant. In fact, what do we use? Even in the South, we have a term for that. When a Christian seems to walk away and fall from the church, they've backslidden, right? They've walked away. Their heart's grown hard. All we mean by that is they're not where they need to be. James 4, 6 says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Step number one, if you are to repent and forsake your idolatry and turn to God, you must humble yourself before God and trust Him that He knows what's best. Verse 8 says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you're double-minded. You're dealing with the idols of the heart, the desires that are contrary to God and His Word. And as God shows you how those idols are coming out on the outside through anger or lying or stealing or whatever it is, you say, God, forgive me for those. You purify your hands and you purify your heart. And verse 10 reminds us, humble yourself in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. What's the promise? You don't have to worry about tomorrow because what will God do? If you humble yourself and repent and turn to him, what will he do? He will exalt you in the proper time. He's got you. He's going to take care of you. Well, this morning, we have finished examining five principles describing how idols get into our hearts and the dangerous consequences of allowing them to remain. Don't ever forget, idolatry thrives when the gospel is not believed and applied. Did you get that? Idolatry thrives when the gospel is not believed and applied. Because the gospel reminds us that Christ is Lord. He is worthy of our worship and obedience. We were created to worship. And if we don't worship the Lord Jesus Christ, we will worship someone or something else, including ourselves. Even a good thing can become a God thing. And that in turn can become a bad thing. So my prayer for you and for me this morning is that we would learn from these idolatrous elders of Israel, that we would deal with the idols of our heart by humbling ourselves, by repenting and turning to Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen? Will you bow your head with me? Lord God, we know that we cannot do any of this apart from you and your goodness and grace apart from the person and work of your son, Jesus Christ. And in many ways, that is so comforting to us. Because even as the song that we sang right before the preaching of your word, there's nothing we could do, nothing we could say, nothing we could be apart from the regenerating, powerful, life-giving gospel that you've given us through your word. And so I ask, Lord God, that you would help us to see the idols of our heart, that we would continue to pray Psalm 139, and that when you show the desires that run contrary to you and your word, and how we practically allow other things or people to capture our hearts or our affections, our emotions, our thoughts, our desires more than you, Lord, would you graciously help us to repent. Give us the grace to see it and to repent of it, to turn from it and to turn to you. And that's really a whole nother message, Lord, 
okay, now what? Now what do we do? Now that we've repented, what do we do? Well, there's the whole process of what we do in place of those idols. So would you help us to learn how to do that from your word? Heavenly Father, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning that does not have a personal relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ, would you please draw them to yourself and show them that there is no better way than through Christ. And help them to see that he is worthy of their love and submission and obedience. Lord, we long to be people who love you with everything. So help us to see the idols and deal with them rightly. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we do have some elders at the front here. If you have any questions or concerns, if you need someone to pray with you, we would be happy to do that. I'll be out in the foyer. If you're new here to Lakeside Bible Church, would love to get the chance to meet you and shake your hand. Thank you so much for coming, and have a blessed Memorial Weekend. Thank you.